Cool. Greetings, it's Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami Beach on this sunny day. I have the pleasure uh, of hosting uh, this event, uh, and it's kind of groundbreaking, Ipe, because you'll be presenting from your smartphone in Kat Kathmandu, uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to show. We don't only have a couple panelists, Ipe, but a lot of people watching you right now on the internet, yeah. so I think certainly they'll be interested in seeing your presentation. And, but first, let's introduce quickly the panelists. Hi, Dr. Camillo, are you there? Are you back yet? You may not, you may have stepped away. And Debbie, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, yes, hello. I'm Dr. Sashank, uh, Mohan Sashank Devi. I'm a neurosurgeon and neurointerventionist. Uh, from, I'm from New Delhi, India. Hello, Dr. Aib. I'm very Hi. happy to see you. Okay. Of course, we are chatting together uh, since a long time. Bennett is with me. <laughs> All the past. Okay. On and out. Very good. Yeah. And welcome. Okay, Ip, it's all yours. Yes. Yeah, so, John, I'll share my screen now. Okay. Now, one second before that. And I, I could, could you just tell the audience what you're doing now to let them know how you can do a smartphone PowerPoint? Uh, okay, John, I've, I've just uh, entered the Zoom, uh, the the link that you gave it to me. Okay. And after that, uh, well, I've just uh, put in the uh, password and I've joined the meeting. You promoted me to a panelist and now I'm sharing the video. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So uh, we're going to be, uh, we, we're going to be doing this, uh, uh, well, I'm interpositor meningium. But it, uh, actually, the biopsy came out to be a germinoma. So it probably is not a well, I'm interpositor meningium. We are waiting for in the immunohistochemistry. But I'm just going to be talking about the approach. So I'm going to share this now. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. All right, so we're going to start this. Okay. So this is the lesion, and you can see this lesion is almost bisecting the thalamus. So you can see it right in the middle of the thalamus. Um, I mean, I'm going to just annotate this. It's uh, you can see in that region. Um, I am going to use the red color. That that is the lesion. Okay. You know, this is excellent. Like you're doing this from your smartphone. Yeah. So I now you can see the lesion here again. Um, I am going to show you again how this lesion looks like. Um, So now, now we have gone the supra supra tent. I mean supra cerebellar infratentorial route. So what we have done is right now we have taken off a few veins on top of the cerebellum. It's very important to have a lax cerebellum. So an LP was done, and uh, this is the torcula. That's a transverse sinus. That that both is a transverse sinus. So we are putting stitches there. So th these are called tack up uh, sutures for the sinus. So once the tack up sutures for the sinus is, is done, this approach is a beautiful approach. The only thing is uh, the reach. So that is why sometimes you have to use an endoscope. With the microscope, the reach is very, very difficult. So unless you have long arms, it's a bit of a difficult approach. So you have to go forward and it has to be slow. That is the main thing about it. So you, this region will be the culmen and uh, then you will have the vein of gallon in this direction. So this is what you're going to see. So slowly, what I do is I generally put gel forms on both sides, keep on irrigating and slowly develop this plane. 
you should not be hurrying here. If you hurry here, you will uh, cause damage to the cerebellum. Now you can see the medial tentorial edge there. The medial tentorial edge you can see there. So that means you have reached anteriorly enough. Now you can see the arachnoid over the vena gallon. So I am going to be dissecting that. That, dissect, that dissector is just sitting there. It is not attached to anything, just sitting there so that I get some space. You can see the medial tentorial space there. That is the medial tentorial space. So uh, we, we can see the medial tentorial space clearly. We can see the venous complex there, the vena gallon there, another venous complex will be seen here. So you can hear what is going to happen is uh, you, you will see both the thalami and uh, uh, you, the lesion is inside the third ventricle. So you have to go between the thalamus. Both the thalami, that's the pulvinar portion of the thalamus. So here you are dissecting the arachnoid of the um, arachnoid of the venogallant from the culmen decli portion of the vermis. So you're slowly dissecting that. I'm using a diamond knife here. Going anteriorly, I'm getting the veins there, vein complex, venous complex. You can see the internal cerebral veins and the vein of those two of them joining to form the internal cerebral vein. Again, one must understand there has to be no hurry in this uh, procedure. Uh, this is not a procedure for any type of hurry. So very relaxedly. Okay, so, so here we are, we are dissecting that arachnoid above the veins. Now I've taken the endoscope. You can see the venous complex there and the arachnoid over the veins. And uh, now I'm taking the precentral cerebellar vein. So the precentral cerebellar vein drains to the uh, vena gallon. Uh, you can see that on the sagittal picture. I mean, uh, on the sagittal MRI, I will show you that. Anterior to that is a tumor. So um, just the precentral cerebellar vein is being taken with the endoscope. You can see the vein of gallon. Uh, the vein of gallon is, that is the vein of gallon. And uh, that was the precentral cerebellar vein, which is uh, bipolar and, and which is being cut now. You can see this, that is a precentral cerebellar vein. And that is being cut now. That is cut and you are entering between the two thalama, you are entering the tumor. So that tumor is being mobilized right now. So you can see one thalamus there and this tumor is being mobilized.
So that is the choroidal artery that's so being taken to one, one side. And you're using, I'm going to be using uh, a debrider soon. Dissecting the lesion away from the floor of the third ventricle. This part of the lesion is okay. But, uh, you know, anteriorly the lesion is very rubbery. So after this part has been excised, I'm using the debrider here. That's the debrider. Cut solely on one side so you're safe but you've got to be very careful while using the debrider in a place like this. Yeah, so that you can see the third ventricle there. That's the third ventricle. And you can see now the third ventricle is clearing up. That tumor is being taken out. Yeah, you can see the third ventricle anteriorly now, very clearly now. Now that is the uh, last, last bit. We are looking above now. That's the telum. Above that is the internal cerebral veins. The third ventricle is open. That's a post-op CT and uh, shows excellent clearance. This is how we operate with the endoscope. That's with the Mitaka arm. And that's how we operate with the microscope, with the navigation pane and the 3D screen. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent, right? Thank you very much. Uh, before we go on, I'd like to introduce you to the Cameroon uh, students. Are you guys there? Can you get your camera working? I want you to meet Ike before Ike goes, takes off. Hello, Cameroon, are you there? Hello, John. Yeah, I'd like you Hello. to meet Ike. Can you get your video camera working? The camera doesn't seem to be on. Hold and, on, John. Hold uh, in the meanwhile, in, uh, well, can you get it to work? You just click on the... Uh, yeah. In the auditorium, it seemed to be working before. You're still there, right? Yes, hold on, yeah. hold on, John. Okay, keep working on it. Okay, uh, any questions or comments, uh, Dr. Kabulo or De Devi, uh, on Ike's presentation or Marco? Uh, one from my side. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Ayab, uh, it's a very good, uh, uh, very good operation indeed. I did not tell you that, but uh, you're an expert. But I just wanted to know what are the precautions while you are positioning the patient? What are the precautions you are supposed to take? Okay, uh, so while positioning, there are two things that you have to be worried about. Yes. Uh, the first one is air embolism, of course. I mean, you need to be... Um, uh, so this is a, a supracerebellar infratentorial approach. This is rather midline. I mean, you could go 
lateral, you could go extreme lateral. But uh, this is a third, third ventricular lesion. So you got to go midline here because it's inside the th third ventricle. So you have to okay. go because, you have to, because the two pulvinas are like that and you have to go midline uh, like that. So while you're positioned, you must go as much as possible with the, uh, the, the neck should be Flexion. flexed. Okay. It should not, uh, I mean, it should not obstruct the great, the great wing. Okay. If the great veins are obstructed, then, uh, you know, it's a very, very difficult approach because all the veins would be engorged and uh, you will not have a good time. That's one thing. Second thing is the air embolism. So, uh, this is not a big problem while positioning, but when, uh, because of the sitting position, um, it's uh, because the veins are in negative pressure. If you are, when you're doing your craniotomy, when you're having small venous bleeds, very important to keep uh, wet patties over that and keep irrigating. If you don't, then you can have a big problem uh, by air embolism. Okay. okay. And the third problem is the length, the length that you have to operate because uh, uh, always uh, one of the problems with this kind of uh, approach is that uh, you know you're standing with your hands up like that and uh, um, you know very soon you will tire out so you need to have a hand rest you okay. you're very very comfortable uh, while you're operating okay and another uh, another thing is if uh, if one has to uh, one is preferring to do the same uh, operation in the prone position what would the point would be uh, because if at all it is in the uh, so, uh, a propped up position of what you have uh, actually done it wouldn't have been much difficult except for the arms being struggling hard with the fatigue but uh, if it is in a prone position what does the tent position should be anything else anything much more to be added for what you were told previously well in a prone position you it's very difficult for you to get into this uh, the third ventricle it's not easy so okay. in rather than prone you should be using something called a concord position okay yeah okay. the concord yes you could uh, concord uh, you could use uh, uh, i mean a concord position or uh, something called a semi sitting position Yes, I mean, these approaches are much more easier. But, uh, you know, uh, I still prefer the suprasarebra and fratentorial in sitting. Um, okay. I mean, that is because there are certain certain advantages, like the, the bleeding and all that. It would never collect uh, inside. It will just uh, it keep on. Because of the gravity. Ah, because of the gravity, it will just keep on going okay. out. So it's a very, very clear field you have, you know. That's, that's one of the best yes. things with the sitting position. So, and okay. plus the sitting position, the cerebellum will start lagging very soon. You really don't need, don't need to put any yes, pressure yes. on the cerebellum. Yes, yes. Once retractor. You, yes, yes. Yeah, once you, that retractor that you have seen is just kept there. It's not connected to Lila or anything. Yes, yes, it yes, is yes. just to have uh, my, above that, that, above that retractor, my instruments are going. So it's just kept there. It's uh, no weight at all on that. So, uh, you know, as soon as the operation progresses, your cerebellum is going to go down and down. And once uh, that happens, your corridor is going to be open, more open and more open. So these are some of the advantages that a sitting position offers for you. Good, good. Very good. Very good. good. Thank Any you. More comments or questions for iPod's presentation? Oh, yes, I have one, John. Go ahead, Marco. Okay. Uh, first of all, hi, hi. And uh, congratulations uh, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting operation, uh, very clear. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, when you have a concomitant hydrocephalus, do you use the same uh, trajectory to perform a third ventriculostomy, uh, systemic ventriculostomy, or you prefer an extra ventricular drainage and then convert to ventricular peritoneal? Um, this patient had hydrocephalus, so... <laughs> I mean, in this case, you know, what I did was a posterior third ventriculostomy. I opened the third ventricle to uh, the cerebellum, I mean, the cerebellum mesencephalic cisterns. So I have gone from the posterior side 
into the third ventricle. So this is a posterior third ventriculostomy. This is enough actually. So, uh, but even then, some sometimes these patients develop uh, problems, hydrocephalus, and in that case, an EVD uh, to take out the blood clot would be just fine. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity I, for the students to meet you before you go. Uh, could you guys, could you guys from Cameroon please introduce yourself one by one? Because that's the value of these conferences is the networking possibilities. And can we can we do that somehow with, yeah, the, yeah. Cameroon, with the Cameroon people, Ulrich? Can we do that? Can we introduce the students one by one? Yeah. So hi, my name is Ulrich Sidney. My name is American. Hello. Student. Uh, from Cameroon, and we have um, Nathalie Sincel. Uh, I'm from a primary surgeon. Hello, welcome. Chuba Overland. I'm from the world. Hello. We can be a resident of the surgery in Cameroon. Okay. Okay. Seven year medical student from Cameroon, a primary surgeon. Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Hello, I'm Dr. Bello, the surgeon in the Yamde Central Hospital. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, Sugar, could you please introduce yourself while you're driving? Uh, don't take your eyes off the road. It's just a really safe road. There is no problem. My name is Sugar Yamil. I'm a nurse surgeon from Peru. I'm really glad to see you all and see all your great job that you are doing, connecting people. Yeah, you're in Peru now. Well, you you were in Nepal before, correct? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm in Peru. There I'm trying Hello. to. Actually, Hello, I'm on sugar. vacation. Okay. Hey, sir. Okay, salute. Okay, Bello, could you please introduce yourself to I? Go ahead, I Bello. Bello, you're on. Hello. Yeah, just. Uh, to introduce yourself, please. Well, I guess he can't hear. How about Save? Save? Save, are you there? Well, I guess not. Okay, and you've already met everyone else. Okay, very good. I, so thanks for your presentation. So you're in Kathmandu? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm in hotel in Kathmandu. Too. Okay, and in the, in the nice part of town, what's that nice section of Kathmandu called? Uh, Tamil. Okay, yeah, that's nice there. Uh, that's yeah, beautiful yeah. temples and good internet connection. The Wi-Fi is there; it's pretty good, huh? Yeah, yeah. The Wi-Fi in the hotel is good. Very good, Ike. Okay, very good. Yeah. See you then, John. Okay, thank you. Not at all. My pleasure, John. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay. One. Good day. This is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami Beach for Neurosurgical TV today. Well, today we have the pleasure of having the first of hopefully many presentations from Cameroon. We have uh, Ulrich Sidney, uh, a neurosurgeon from Cameroon that's gonna to give today's presentation. He put together this webinar of uh, multiple uh, neuroanatomy presentations. And once Victor Hugo Perez Perez heard about it, he wanted to present too, so he's gonna present after Ulrich. So uh, let, let's introduce uh, the panelists first. Uh, because part of the value of this platform is networking. So let's start with the classroom of students. Uh, let's introduce yourselves one by one, please. Let's see, I gotta un Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. please introduce yourself. Hi, Dylan Okay, welcome, okay. Next. Hi, I'm Nadia. Oh. Can you hear that okay, everyone? Because you guys are on two screens, actually. I can't tell which one is which. <laughs> you got you got two screens going there. That's okay. It's it's okay. Don't worry about it. Stefan, can you please introduce yourself? Okay, welcome, Stefan. And uh, Be you. Bello, could you please introduce yourself? 
Hello, good morning. I'm Dr. Bello, a neurosurgeon in Yaoundé Central Hospital. Okay, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Kabulo. Yes, my name is Dr. Kabulo from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Currently, I'm a final year neurosurgery resident at the University of Zimbabwe. Okay, you're welcome, Dr. And a frequent uh, visitor here. And let's see, Roland, let's see, Roland, I guess that screen is. And Marco, please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Marco. I'm from uh, Italy, northern part. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon. Okay, welcome, Marco. Franklin, could you please introduce yourself? Franklin, can you hear me okay? Frank, Franklin, tenant, tenant, okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, introduce yourself. I'm teaching, yes, I'm teaching Franklin, a medical student for University of Mountain in Cameroon, and a classmate of Stefan Gemmel. Thank you. Okay. Well, and a spirit and aspiring for nourishing okay. neurosurgeon. Sorry for, for my English. I'm I'm francophone, so uh, my English is not very very good. No, okay. no, I understand it very well. It's better than my French. Uh, okay, and welcome, uh, Ulrich, and uh, thank you for putting this together. Please briefly introduce yourself and uh, on with your presentation. Um, Thank you, John. Um, I'm Ulrich Sidney, Panea medical student, an aspiring neurosurgeon. Um, we created a group recently, the African, uh, the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, made up of medical students, made up of residents who want to become neurosurgeons. And fortunately, we were able to team up with John to come up with these uh, lectures. The objectives are we should be able to learn about uh, about neuro neurosurgery, uh, neuroanatomy, and we should be able to make uh, new contacts because neurosurgical TV is about making new contacts. So it's always a good thing to meet uh, Marco, Dr. Sugini, Dr. Cabulo. Uh, nice meeting you guys, and we hope we can get um, future collaborations in terms of education, research, and. Uh, exchange skills. Now, today, I'll be kicking off the very first of our lectures. Um, it will be interactive, and I'm very glad that we have um, senior neurosurgeons here that will be able to help us to better our, uh, our presentations. So we'll be starting with the frontal bone. What we notice is, unfortunately, our internet connection is kind of slow. So given that it is slow, we will have to share the screen, then um, come off the screen share to be able to, to switch slides, then get back. So you guys bear with me. Uh, these are the realities of um, third world countries. Um, without further ado, I'll be starting and screen sharing. I think we're losing our, okay. I think we're losing your audio. Can you hear me? Uh... Already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Well, we got the audio. Okay, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay, so um, the frontal bone is a flat pneumatized bone compose, um, which composes the calvaria of the skull. Um, the frontal bone is part of the neurocranium, which is opposed to the viscerocranium. The viscerocranium uh, is that part of the bone that uh, constitutes the face. Whereas the, the neurocranium is going to constitute the skull vault and the skull base. Uh, when we get back to embryology, um, we find out that um, the frontal bone actually originates from the neural crest, the neural crest, which will later on give us um, a mesenchymal tissue. This mesenchymal tissue will then be uh, ossified. It is intermembranous uh, ossification so that's why it's um, also it's also part of desmocranium. So um, we will be talking about the frontal bone uh, on its anatomical aspects, the different parts of the frontal bone. But we will equally be given um, some information about uh, the surgical importance of uh, some of these structures. So we will start. Um, the frontal bone has uh, an external 
part and an internal part. And these two parts are uh, separated by uh, the diploid. So uh, it's spongy bone that uh, uh, forms, uh, that has red bone marrow, so participates in hematopoiesis. Uh, this frontal bone in embryology, once it uh, ossificates, it does so from the tubercles, the tuba, uh, frontal tuba. And then the frontal tuba, uh, actually at the beginning, we have two. So they're separated by a suture, which is called the frontal suture. Uh, the frontal suture is going to, or metopic suture, is going to be uh, ossified during uh, um, uterine growth. So later on, we end up with this single bone, which we can see here, which is cup-shaped, and which constitutes the anterior and superior part of the skull. And it's going to be able to protect the contents of the brain, um, of the skull, excuse me, um, so that these, con these contents will not be vulnerable to injuries. Now, uh, I get off the screen share, sorry. I need to switch. Okay, you're off screen share now. Yeah, I need to switch real quick. Yeah, you're off screen share now. And so I'm going to be getting all the other bones away. Okay. okay. You're trying to screen share now, right? So, okay, you back off. There you go. You're on the screen share. Yeah. So the, the frontal bone um, is part of a very complex architectural uh, structure of the skull. So what we notice is this bone will end up articulating with up to 12 bones. So here we can see the frontal bone articulating at the top with the parietal bone. There are two of them uh, on the left and the right. We can equally see that this uh, frontal bone will articulate with the, uh, the, the sphenoid bone as well, the zygoma, the zygoma which we can see. We can, uh, we also have the uh, maxillary, we have the nasal bone, we have the lacrimal bone, and we have the ethmoid. So this bone is very important for any neurosurgeon because you need to understand this, the intricacies of uh, only, not only its articulations, but uh, its structure because we're going to find out later on that the approaches through this fr uh, frontal bone and it's neighboring bones that help the neurosurgeon access certain lesions. So um, the frontal bone is um, equally um, very important in the roof of the orbit because it forms the anterior medial part of the orbit. And so we can, as we can see in this view, it, it will constitute the roof of the orbit together with um, the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And it will be articulating with, like we said, the edmoid, as well as the, the uh, maxillary bone, the nasal bone. Now, the two nasal bones will come together and then they'll be able to articulate with the frontal bone and then that point will be called the nasian. Uh, that will be very important for, the, uh, for those uh, operations that involve um, external uh, ventricular drainage. Because when we have to um, uh, catheterize the ventricles, this is one of those um, very important anatomical landmarks which we'll be using. Uh, the, like we said, the frontal bone has um, it's a flat bone, so most of it is squamous, so it has a squamous part. And then you have uh, a nasal portion, we are talking about the nasal portion, and it has an orbital portion which forms the roof of the orbit. So talking about this orbital portion, what we'll notice is it forms um, uh, um, an arcade, a superciliary arcade. And then when both superciliary arcades come together, they form this depression, a landmark called the glabella, the glabella. And then what we notice is on this uh, superciliary arch, we can find some uh, particular anatomical landmarks like the, 
Oh, sorry. Oh. Mm, like like the um, uh, supraorbital foramen, and then the 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 um, where we will have the uh, vessels and nerves. For that, that's the supraorbital vessels and nerves, and um, we we will also have um, important landmarks at the back of this bone because uh, behind the external. Uh, okay, I think we're losing a little audio. It's okay. It's okay. I think they usually get it back shortly. Can you guys hear me? Maybe I'm frozen. Okay. Can anybody hear me? Can you hear me, Marco? Yeah, I can hear you, John. Okay, good. Okay. So I think, yeah, I think it's a little frozen there. We just hang on there. Yeah, probably the connection from Cameroon is. Yeah, some, sometimes actually, yeah, it's better that you reboot. Hello, there's your Italian associate. How are you doing, Dr. Skinny? You're in the hospital, right? All right. Yeah, where are you? Do, you? do you know Marco? Marco is from Parma, correct, Marco? Yeah, we know each other. Yeah. Oh, okay. You guys know each other. Okay, we good. Are, we're both Italian. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, very good. Ciao, Dan. <laughs> okay, well, what, Ciao. we're waiting. Yeah, we're waiting, uh, Dr. Sugini, for um, there's some bandwidth issues. In Cameroon, they're seeing if they can reboot. Can you hear me, Ulrich? Yes, John. Oh, okay. Very good. So you're working on it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Don't worry. We're here. Yeah. Th thanks. Thanks for being there. Thanks. Well, uh, yeah. Done. So, I. I I, I don't actually know where uh, you guys lost uh, where you guys lost me. So um, okay, there you go. Okay, yeah. So w um, I was mentioning um, the different the different landmarks we can notice at the uh, external surface of the frontal bone. So at the external surface of the frontal bone, we're talking about the supraciliary arches, which when they join form the glabella. And on this uh, model, we can see uh, a remnant of what we call the frontal suture or metopic suture. Um, these uh, superciliary arches um, have other landmarks like the super uh, orb the supraorbital foramen, and this supraorbital foramen uh, will be uh, a way of passage for the supraorbital vessels and supraorbital nerve. Um, I was equally saying that the frontal bone will articulate with up to 12 bones. So it, it, it's going to articulate with the, with the zygoma, with the sphenoid bone, with the maxillary, with the nasal bones, with the edmoidal and lacrimal bone. So when the two nasal bones articulate with the uh, frontal bone, we have a landmark, the nasion, very important, for, um, especially in uh, external ventricular drainage. Um, other landmarks we were uh, mentioning was at the back um, of this external surface, we find pneumatized air cells called the frontal sinuses. And the frontal sinuses are uh, embryologically derived from the migration of anterior, anterior superior um, ethmoidal air cells. And then at two years of age, they will, they will start pneumatizing. So what we get is the head feels lighter, but they are also helpful because they have a mucosa and they will be draining into the middle meatus in the uh, in the nasal um, cavity. Um, in terms of neurosurgical importance, the frontal sinuses um, have been important in cases where we want to do sequestrectomy, get uh, rid of sequestrates. 
So, um, and as well as um, parental signing and duration. So, um, those are equally very important landmarks. Um, otherwise, we have um, the frontal bone, which articulates with um, the parietal bone. And when they articulate with the parietal bone, they form the coronal suture. Um, that's a very important landmark as well for external ventricular drainage because we use that to have the three centimeter uh, distance. Uh, with uh, children, the articulation between the frontal bone and the uh, and the different pari and the two parietal mm -hmm. bones uh, gives this space. The space is a uh, fontanel. That's the anterior fontanel. Very important for uh, Doppler. Um, transcranial Doppler, very important as well for functions, which can help to uh, get some CS in, in kids uh, for diagnosis, but equally for treatment, because it, it has happened, I know it's not the case anymore, for example, in high income countries, but it has happened that to help relieve an infant, we have to, pung, um, we have to um, function this uh, fontanel several times. Um, the next thing we'll be talking about is the fact that the frontal bone contributes to the roof of the orbit. So it contributes to the anterior, uh, anterior and superior and medial part of the orbit, while the sphenoid bone, specifically the lesser wing, will contribute as well to, uh, to the roof of the orbit. So uh, next, I'll, I'll be talking about the internal of the frontal bone, so I have to get off the screen share. Just uh, give me a minute, please. You doing okay there, uh, Ulrich? Did we lose Ulrich? No, John, no, John. It's okay. Okay, there we go. I'm back, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. So, the internal surface of uh, the frontal bone. What we're having here is a posterior view of the frontal bone. And uh, we can see the internal table, the external table, and between the internal and external table, what we have is the diploid. Um, now, the internal surface has uh, some notable landmarks. We have landmarks that are due to the gyri of the frontal lobe. Uh, we equally have landmarks that are due to the anterior meningeal arteries and uh, uh, landmarks that will be due to the uh, passionic granulations, which are subarachnoid granulations, permit that, that uh, have a role in the resorption of CSF. Now, another very important landmark uh, on this surface is the um, frontal crest. The frontal crest will uh, have a groove in the middle. This groove is um, where we can find the impression of the superior sagittal sinus, whereas the frontal crest will be uh, the point of insertion for the, um, uh, the dura. This dura is called the fault cerebri. So this is the region we're talking about. Try and get us closer. So, we are here, and what we can see is the crest. And then this is the orbital part of the bone, which forms the roof of the orbit. So this orbital part of the frontal bone, together with this uh, frontal crest, they come and then they, 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 they give this notch, which is called the edmoidal notch. The edmoidal notch will articulate with the edmoid bone and both of them will leave uh, a very small opening, foramen cecum. The foramen cecum might 
uh, let uh, pass some vessels, but it's not always the case. So when this, when, when this is the case, we can find emissary veins passing through this uh, foramen cecum. So um, this is the internal surface. We spoke about the orbital part of the frontal bone. We spoke about the squamous part of the frontal bone. And then there's a nasal part of the frontal bone. This nasal part of the frontal bone uh, plays a role because it, it contributes to the roof of the, nas uh, of the nasal cavity. So this is it, we can, we can view it here. So this front, the frontal part of the nasal bone will be very useful for the, the roof of the nasal cavity. And we spoke about the nasion where all the two nasal bones will come and articulate. Um, with that, we will um, stop a moment here. If there's any questions, you can uh, go ahead and ask the questions, any remarks. Then we will go ahead and talk about the, the uh, anatomical uh, um, structures that we can find around the frontal bone. Okay, any questions uh, from the, any of the panelists or comments? Okay, go ahead, uh, Sydney. Ulrich. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can go ahead, uh, Ulrich. Yeah. So here, here we have um, the rest of the skull and then the the arterial circulation. Like we know, the external circulation comes from the external carotid artery and while the internal, uh, mostly from the internal carotid artery. Um, what we can notice here, um, let me zoom. So we were talking about the, the supraorbital um, foramen which, led, um, which gave passage to the supraorbital arteries and veins. So this is the supraorbital artery going through the supraorbital foramen. And, um, so this as well with the, um, the, the, I'm sorry. Let me put the, the veins. Yeah, there we go. So, this, so this, 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 these, are, these are the structures that will go on here. Um, an, an important um, fact to note is that when we talk about uh, veins and arteries uh, uh, around the skull, we have some veins that can drain from the external uh, part of the skull into the internal. These are emissary veins, and they can be responsible um, for infections in the, inside the, the, the skull. So they, they might be, uh, for example, from the drainage of a furuncle or from sinusitis, and then they might explain why a patient will have uh, meningitis. Um, going forward, the, the frontal bone uh, gives this um, fossa, this is the temporal fossa, and uh, it articulates with the parietal, um, the sphenoid, and the, the temporal bone. And this is important for the frontotemporal or zygomatic approach because this is, um, it is knowledge of this frontal bone that will help um, uh, the, the future neurosurgeon, that's the resident, to be able to uh, um, uh, uh, use this approach. Obviously there are variations. It can be a simple frontotemporal uh, frontal temporal, um, temporal orbital approach or a frontotemporal orbital zygomatic um, approach. So that was it. That was what we had to give about the, the frontal bone. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off there, uh, Ulrich. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it, what we're saying, uh, yeah, okay, you can get off that screen share now. Just, uh, just click on the, uh, 
in the camera there thing there. Get off the screen share, uh, Ulrich. Just Hold on. yeah, put exit yeah exit uh, live exit screen share at the top. Should be at the top of the. Um, I, I don't have it anymore. Okay, no problem. Anyways, uh, Ulrich, let me just uh, make a comment. I'm not a neurosurgeon, however, I did study neuroanatomy. One of the book that really helped me through was a book called Sidman and Sidman. It was a, it's a program text because it was difficult for me to understand the, the way that nerves decussate and cross. And uh, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with those terms, but it was very confusing. Uh, the the neuro what what neuroanatomy books do you guys use now? Because I know books change. What books do you guys do use now? Uh, over here. The books from Netta, some from Team. Oh, Netter, Frank. Yeah. Netter. Oh, Frank Netter. The, oh, the illustrations. He does neuro. He does neuroanatomy. Yeah, yeah. He's amazing yeah. illustrations, right? Yeah, yeah. They're very good illustrations. So most of the most of the students use that now. Yes, they do. Most of them. Oh, okay. Now, how much uh, how much studying do you? Do you what do you do on the internet? Do you do any in so things, something like neuroanatomy? Do you do any or is it mostly textbooks? It's mostly textbooks. Um, those that go on uh, on the, the internet usually by themselves. It's not in the it's not in, it's not in the curriculum. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think maybe Marco or maybe uh, Mark someone could comment on um, on the, the gentleman from Florida, the well-known gentleman, his name escapes me now. I I should be shot. But a neurosurgical, uh, you know who I mean, right? The uh, the famous Rotan, Rotan, Rotan's anatomy. You, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Rotan, yeah, Rotan, microsurgical anatomy. Yeah, yeah. He's he's obviously a classic. Uh, now, do you guys spend any time looking at his uh, his anatomy drawings? Yeah, um, we've been we've been following um, his videos on YouTube because he started uploading videos on neurosurgical access by Rota. Yeah, you know there've been we've had a couple of fellows because he used to entertain. He was he was based in Gainesville, Florida. You probably know know that, but he he has entertained like hundreds of fellows from around the world. I mean, he passed away about two years ago. But he entertained hundreds of fellows from around the world, uh, so you'll you'll run into people probably, uh, Ulrich at, at uh, certainly at Harvard, but maybe in other parts of the world, who have interacted with Dr. Rotan. Uh, now, uh, now certainly, let's see here, Marco, have you 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 and Dr. Savini probably have studied Dr. Rotan, correct? <laughs> Not, not much. Can you repeat? I I haven't heard. Okay, have you are you familiar with Dr. Rotan? The Rotan, his anatomical drawings. Yeah, Rotan, absolutely. Uh, one of the our referral test the test book for uh, neurosurgery and uh, neuroanatomy. Uh, very uh, complete. Uh, joint and anatomy with the surgical approach. So uh, absolutely one of uh, our referrals with the regular neuronal surgery. You know, being a neurosurgeon, uh, uh, one thing that impressed me was their need to keep up with neuroanatomy, even after, even after residency. Uh, what textbooks do you use, uh, Dr. Sugini and, and Dr. Maloney? To review before a case. If you have a case and you really want to make sure of your neuroanatomy, what text do you go to now? Uh, when, uh, when, uh, Giovanni, do you want to join Giovanni? Do you want to ask Okay. Dr. Sugini, what, what text do you use before a case, say, if you want to review your neuroanatomy? It's a, what source do you use? Yeah, let me unmute you there. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Very uh, okay. speedy is, uh, for example, also the atlas from uh, Dr. Cohen in uh, in Inter. I don't know um, if you if you know. Yeah, Dr. Aaron Cohen. Yeah, example. Aaron Cohen from he's he's from Indiana, or New York, or 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Cleveland. Cleveland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't, don't have Cleveland. For example, is uh, you can you can also with your uh, iPhone. Huh? Oh really? And uh, um, it's better as uh, and the um, textbook. Um, yeah. Also, there is a neurosurgical atlas. Uh, uh, also, as textbooks, for example. Uh, um, there is a German textbook no, uh, normally, other, um, and there is a, a new book, uh, a very good new book for uh, the approach, um, um, cranial approach uh, in neuro, neurosurgery. Uh, uh, it's kind of publicity, but uh, uh, it's, it's this one. Um, I use normally uh, this textbook. Okay. And uh, do you frequently review before cases, or, or only if you have a case that's a different type of case for you? Do, like before every case, do you review the neuroanatomy, or just in cases where you haven't done before? Uh, neuroanatomy, you you have to, <laughs> and you have to uh, study uh, the neuroanatomy with the yeah. Also with the rotten, while well, rotten is uh, is uh, the better and complete uh, book and atlas, and there is also a rotten edition in uh, um, in PDF uh, or the, in the internet, and there is also in uh, YouTube uh, you can also um, a lecture from rotten. Um, there is very uh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Very, very interesting. Sorry, sorry, my Deutsch, my German. Okay. Well, you know, we're having a, an app made for neurosurgical TV, and certainly we have to include links to good neuroanatomy sources. And uh, maybe once we finish it, well, we're near finishing, we'll ask you guys, you know, what sites do you look at? You know, Wetland Roton, I guess there probably be four or five really popular neuroanatomy websites that we'd like to make it easily accessible uh, on the smartphone. Hopefully, we'll be able to do that. There is also a free, uh, I have not uh, the list uh, um, here, but uh, there is uh, many uh, free um, websites from, uh, from neuroanatomy, uh, neurovascular anatomy, and uh, neuroanatomy with uh, neuroradiology. That is there is very, very important also. While uh, um, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's very good uh, study the neuroanatomy uh, between the correlation with, uh, uh, for example, at the uh, CT scan, for example. Uh, uh, could, could for a uh, lumbar or the, for, for the spine um, uh, with the uh, uh, MRI. Okay, now before, now I don't know how much of the African kids are going to be exposed, exposed to live di dissection, dissection of, of, uh, of brain, but um, I guess that helped you a lot. I mean, after you had your neuroanatomy basis, um, how did you feel? I mean, did you feel you knew a lot better once you did inside dissections and stuff? I, I, or what point would you suggest a student? to do a dissection, you're ready for a dissection. Do you suggest really knowing neuroanatomy cold before you do a dissection on a, on, on a corpse, on a um, cadaver I'm talking about? Yeah, that definitely, definitely is, a, is absolutely uh, important and uh, um, very, the, uh, very teaching uh, uh, like, uh, like way. Uh, for I can tell by myself uh, to uh, study peripheral nerve surgery. If you study from book, uh, is uh, absolutely important. But when you touch the anatomy in calavera dissection, you perform an approach. Uh, is uh, uh, I can I don't want to say totally different, but uh, uh, you can uh, is another feeling. Is another feeling, and you remember very well. The anatomy when you uh, join a case, uh, a true case in operating room. Uh, for example, uh, I perform a common peroneal nerve releasing 
some days ago. Uh, and I study a lot from my books, with my referral book for peripheral nerve surgery. But uh, in my mind, they were the approach I performed during my cadaveric dissection course. So it is very important uh, to touch the anatomy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, you know, we can speak frankly here. I mean, uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's necessary, you know, dissection on uh, cadavers is a part of education. And, and we can't be giddy about that. It's part of medicine. That's part, partly the way we learned ever since your associate, Leonardo da Vinci. He's, he's one of the first guys that did dissections, right, on anatomy. Marco and Dr. Sugini, isn't Leonardo da Vinci one of the first uh. anatomists? <laughs> <laughs> eh? Leonardo was uh, a very, a very, a very, uh, a very intelligent uh, um, man, and uh, uh, I think Leonardo. But uh, now, uh, um, Leonardo would uh, uh, would uh, uh, work uh, with uh, uh, three um, three D uh, anatomy also. Oh, Modern. yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Like, how you guys experienced with doing the three D anatomy at all? Uh, because I know it's a new thing. I don't know much about the three D anatomy. Do you, have you used that at all, uh, Marco? Three D anatomy, neuroanatomy? No. Uh, well, I I use the the same uh, uh, application of the Cameron colleagues. The, uh, oh, okay, that, that we just saw Microsoft. It can, it can, it is a, a good help for uh, uh, to plan uh, a surgery. Then, uh, using the neural navigation is uh, the uh, uh, the preferred route to plan a uh, um, uh, and to plan surgery. Uh, I think neural navigation is a revolutionary uh, and uh, uh, unrecognizable in the daily activity in planning a surgery. Okay, um, now the, the, for the Cameroon students, uh, I guess neuroanatomy obviously is part of your curriculum. Uh, and all you guys are at different stages of your medical career, I guess second year, seventh year, fifth year, correct? Uh, yeah. I, imagine, I imagine it's probably the first year you take, I mean, obviously anatomy, <laughs> first year medical school. It's the same, I'm sure, in Cameroon. Hey, John, John, sorry. Yeah, Ulrich, it's a first year course, right? In the uh, uh, medical school there? Say, yeah. Dr. Sugini has something to say. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, we, we have a few minutes uh, till Victor Dr. starts. John, so. Dr. Sugini is trying to talk. Okay, go uh, ahead, Dr. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, John, uh, John and, uh, I want to uh, say about uh, the 3, um, 3D anatomy. Uh, there is uh, um, a very, um, a very good uh, models from from uh, an algorithm from Newton. There is uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, neurosurgeon um, in cadaver um, and uh, uh, 3D uh, printed uh, um, models from an an algorithm um, in a in a brain for a cadaver. Um, while uh, uh, the residents uh, you. you can um, uh, practice uh, about uh, the aneurysm. Okay, so uh, like is what was the name, please, Dr. Sugini? What's the name of this um, of this yeah. YouTube channel? And uh, there is, a, I know uh, about a, a, um, a book and a article about the, the uh, Dr. Newton. L A W T O N. Yeah. Yeah, doctor, okay, Doctor, yeah. you want me to look for it? I can look for it and, and put it up here. Doctor Roton's book, you talking about? Yeah, the Doctor uh, Roton is the uh, the man who uh, succeed to uh, to uh, how is the called the neurosurgeon from Phoenix? Uh, um, I can remember, uh, but the, the Barrow Institute, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. From Spetzler, okay. After Spetzler, okay. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 
Yeah, no, yes, John, about, about your question, we, we are from various, back, um, various levels. So I'm a final year medical student, and then let me show you. Um, we have Dylan. Yeah. Oh. 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 We see only the truth. So Dylan is a seven-year medical student. Okay. So, yeah, and then Natalie is already a medical doctor. And then, then we have Dr. Chufo Roland, Dr. Roland, who is already a neurosurgeon, and uh, Dr. Ligani, who is uh, a resident. We, we, we don't get, we don't get um, cadaver dis dissections, unfortunately. So we, we have to uh, read these things in books day, day after day. And uh, like Dr. Meloni said, um, it's not the same thing, reading and then being able to touch. There's a really big difference. We notice it as well. So we, we, we are trying to find ways to, 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 to fill that gap because it's a big issue for us at the moment. Well, you know, uh, since it's a closed community, we can talk this way, but uh, it's important. Uh, and you'll get this from Victor when you speak to him. He does a lot of dissections of brains uh, uh, and it helps to have a cadaver and he calls them fresh, uh, fresh cadavers because I guess you can, you know, the anatomy's clearer once you do a, a, quote, a fresh dissection on a cadaver as opposed to, you know, a cadaver that's old. We can speak frankly like this because, you know, in medicine, but this is, you know, and, and let me comment, you know, there's a big neuro anatomical center in Bologna, uh, Italy, and maybe you guys have been there. Can you comment on that? The big anatomy center in Bologna. Are you familiar with that? There's a big, I don't know if it's neuroanatomy or anatomy center. Bologna has a big neuroanatomy center. Is that, do you guys know about it at all? Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, there's someone there. there two that's... minutes, two minutes. <laughs> okay, that's okay. How about you, Marco? Have you been... Two minutes. Um, um... Have you been there, Dr. Uh, uh, Marco, the, to Bologna? Have you heard of it at all, being a big anatomical center? Well, actually, I didn't know about that. I know there are good uh, cadaveric course in Turin. In Turin? Turin? Uh, by Ducati, Professor Ducati. Uh, but about Bologna, uh, actually, I didn't know, uh, John. Well, you know, Marco, I, I only do that because I ran into someone, uh, Clarissa Galesi. She's a neuroanatomist, and she said, oh, Bologna is a big anatom a big anatom uh, an anatomy center yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so uh hopefully we'll be able to collaborate with them and get them active on the on, because hopefully we want to have a neuroanatomy channel and have frequent lectures and uh, and i appreciate over putting some structure into this rather than yeah. have a haphazard approach it's kind of a structured approach to neuroanatomy it's a start uh, yeah. But um, there is a, yeah, now sorry. there's a question there. We have, someone has a hand raised. Go ahead. Just unmute there. Go ahead. I want to ask for the neurosurgeons who are here. Please, can you uh, give us a kind of kind of a presentation on neuroanatomy? Yes. Sorry, uh, ask. I want to ask for the neurosurgeons who are here. Sorry, you know me see me. I want to ask if you can give us some kind of kind of a, a presentation how can we present to present better and, uh, fluently and uh, there's also another thing that is really disturbing is um, to correlate to correlate uh, with uh, clinical uh, clinical practice clinical, clinical practice and surgery actually that's the difficulties that i faced Did you get that, John? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was paying attention to this. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you want to, you want to call anyone else want to comment? The question sorry. Natalie is asking, probably for Dr. Marco, like, do you have any tips, any advice for better presentations and to be able to uh, bring clinical practice relevance into the neuroanatomical lectures? Do you have any advice for us? Uh, well, uh, perhaps, well, go ahead, Marco, okay, why don't I, you go first? You're, you're, I, can, I can also help there, 
Mm, well, um, actually, I think the best idea could be to uh, uh, to talk about the anatomy, obviously, but then uh, show um, uh, uh, the application of the anatomy with the approach. For example, or uh, you talk about um, what can I can say the. Uh, uh, anterior cerebral artery uh, and uh, or, uh, um, carotid in, uh, intracranial carotid artery in relation with the uh, optic nerve. Let's talk also about the pterygoid approach uh, described by Azarghi. Uh, when you can see the, uh, the approach to the uh, uh, pterygoid approach and the uh, relation uh, of the structure. So, uh, internal carotid artery with the optic nerve uh, and uh, uh, an application in the clinical practice, for example, for uh, anterior circulation and events. Okay. If you have a good case to show, when you talk about the case, for example, a patient with, uh, um, as, as did the uh, eye cherry and before, uh, you talk about uh, a turbentrical tumor, and it was a, a good uh, way to talk also about the structure uh, of the great uh, 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 vein, uh, the pineal glands, and all the structure in the, uh, in the supra, supra cerebral aspect. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Cabullo, you okay. want to give us some advice? Yes. I wanted just to add something on what Dr. Marco is saying. Uh, it's good initiative. I appreciate, I really appreciate what you are doing. And uh, since you want to become a surgeon, what you have to do is to put more clinical correlation and especially relation between structures. When you are talking about like uh, what Dr. Marco is saying, you talk about uh, posterior cerebral artery, you talk about uh, its part, there's P1, P2, P3, uh, the branches which are coming from P1, uh, branches which are coming from P2. You see, like uh, when you're talking about posterior cerebral um, artery with the posterior, uh, superior cerebellar artery, the third nerve is going in between two. If you get an aneurysm there, how it will manifest, for example, with compression of the third nerve. So you talk about those things. Uh, I will also recommend you to check a book uh, by Roton. Uh, that anatomy by Rotor. It's a nice book. It will help you to know about the uh, relationship of the structures, especially uh, surgical anatomy. Because you want to be a surgeon, you want to know the surgical anatomy, especially okay. like you are talking about frontal bone. Uh, when you are doing this approach, where do you open? Where do you, for example, doing your craniotomy? Where are you going to place your bare or to avoid this structure, you see? So I think it's, it will be better if you put more surgical anatomy and clinical correlations. I think check the, 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 the Rotten book, it will help you too much. Yeah, I don't know if Dr. Marco is Yeah, in fact, I think <laughs> as just Dr. Pabulo highlighted in the Rotten neuroanatomy books, Rotten described the anatomy in the several aspects, but then in the last paragraph, he, he say, okay, I have described the anatomy, then I tell you what's the approach is useful to see the anatomy. Uh, describing, for example, the pterygoid approach, or the, uh, if you talk about uh, the posterior fossa, you talk about the uh, suboccipital approach. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. That, that was really very helpful. Thank you, guys. Thank you know, I have a comment. Excuse me, Ulrich. Um, when you neurosurgeons took neuroanatomy, did you know at that time you wanted to be a neurosurgeon, or did you take neuroanatomy and said, oh, I, I want to keep doing this? Or did you already know when you took neuroanatomy? Why don't you start with you, Dr. Cabullo? When you took neuroanatomy, did you know you were going to be a neurosurgeon at that point? Dr. Kubulo, do you, do you remember? When, when I was doing my anatomy, I didn't know that I would be a neurosurgeon. Oh, okay. So it came in yeah. that decision. When did, when, did, when did you decide you wanted to be a neurosurgeon? 
uh, I decided to be a neurosurgeon when I was already working because I finished my undergrad in 2008. I worked for five years. So it was like the fifth year of my practice. Then I decided to, 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 to become a neurosurgeon. So okay. yeah, then I did a proper anatomy. Uh, with the, we have a cadaveric lab here in Zimbabwe where we are doing dissection on uh, cadavers. And also there is a, a nice cadaveric lab in Jordan, in Amman, with Professor Ibrahim Shbe. I was there and uh, Professor Dolenk joined us. He was teaching us uh, scalp bears. Uh, so it was a nice anatomy day. There is a, there is a very good uh, cadaveric lab in Amman. Well, you know, I imagine in Cameroon they'll have to travel to get to a cadaver dissection. Uh, I don't know, maybe you know, uh, Ulrich, is there any cadaver dissections in Cameroon at your capital city or you have to go to no, another no, city? No, 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 Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, we have a department of anatomy where we are doing dissections. I remember when I was in part one in neurosurgery, we had, uh, I think, more than 20 cadavers where we were doing our dissection. Yeah, so I think it's also better, like, you write a letter to one university where there's a cadaver, cadaveric lab, then you join, you go for an attachment of three, four months, and you do your dissections, again, you go back. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Kabulo. Thanks, Dr. Kabulo. Yes, go, go ahead, Marco. You have something to say? Go ahead, Marco. Yeah, uh, a question for the colleague from Cameroon. Sure. You, say, uh, you cannot perform a cadaveric dissection in Cameroon uh, because you don't have the, uh, the phone, the organization, or there is some laws against cadaveric dissection? Yeah, that's a good point, Marco. Some, some countries, there's laws against it, right? Mm. Laws. So religious, religious, religious reasons. Well, that's all. It's yeah. not well organized. That, that's the issue. Well so that's not an issue, Ulrich? It's, it's not well organized. It's not, there's no law against. Oh, okay. Uh, how about you, Dr. Sugini? Did you, when you took their anatomy, uh, did you know you were going to be a neurosurgeon? I don't know. On mute, on mute, I was, uh, I was a writer, um, uh, I was writer and uh, SMS. Um, can you can you repeat, John, please? Yeah, when, uh, when did you when you took their anatomy as a student? Did you know that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon, or did you decide after neuroanatomy? Yeah, after neuroanatomy. Okay, after. So it didn't particularly interest you when you took it? It was like just a part of anatomy or you did you really become interested in that part of anatomy? Mm, I think the vascular system. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't hear you. The ambulance called by. <laughs> So. Then, uh, uh, Dr. John, uh, for young, uh, the young from Cameroon, uh, for you to be a neurosurgeon, you don't need to do only neuroanatomy. You have to do anatomy of the body. Because okay. I will just give them a few examples. When you are doing your decompressive craniotomy, you remove your bone, you have to put it in the abdominal wall. So you have to know that anatomy where you are going to put your bone. Sometimes you need a graft. To do your anterior cervical discectomy infusion, you have to take, for example, a graft from a iliac crest. So, like uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, the program, when you are in part one, you're doing your basic sciences, you do the full anatomy in three months, three, I think four months, full anatomy, everything. Just take like lower limbs for two weeks, abdomen for two weeks, uh, upper limbs for two weeks, chest, and so on. Because you can do anterior approach by when you're doing like uh, a thoracic discectomy, you do your thoracotomy. So you have to know the anatomy of the chest for you to do thoracotomy and when reach that this. You, 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 you can get a graft from fibula or you can take a rib, you replace uh, uh, the inter, um, the, the, the disc. So you have to know also the anatomy of where you're going to get your graft. So to be a neurosurgeon, you have to be anatomist. You have to know the whole anatomy, not only neuroanatomy. So it's better for them to do 
anatomy. Yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> Dr. Gabor, I'd like to uh, recognize the entrance of Victor Hugo Perez Perez, the world renowned neuroanatomist. Victor, we're, we're, we're just talking about you know, when in their careers these neurosurgeons knew they wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And was it related to their study of neuroanatomy in med schools? First of all, Victor, welcome. Thank you, uh, uh, dear uh, John. Welcome. When did you know, Victor, that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon? Was it after you took neuroanatomy in med school or before or after? Mm -hmm. When? When I was studying medicine, uh, uh, you know, my teacher was a very well-known brain surgeon. So when I uh, have, uh, when I had uh, his classes, uh, I was uh, very interested in doing uh, neurosurgery. Okay, it was after uh, that that you decided. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, okay, any more before we wrap it up and we start Victor's presentation? Uh, the students, do you have any comments or questions of the neurosurgeons? Of any of them? Okay, okay, Victor, I guess uh, welcome. And uh, we've done a lot of presentations together. You've done a lot for the students, and we hope to uh, continue to have uh, you give presentations and they'll see. Uh, why you're considered a preeminent neuroanatomist. So it's all yours, Victor. Yes. Can you see the... Yes, uh, it's not... Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, microsurgical anatomy of the craniocervical junction. Uh, this is Dr. Victor Hugo Perez Perez, brain surgeon, Mexico City. I am working in this institution, IMSS. Uh, I have the honor to, to be involved with the Committee of Neurosurgical Anatomy of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this uh, a challenge uh, region uh, about the craniocervical junction. Uh, this is one of the anatomical regions that can be surgically treated in 360 degrees. Uh, so you can go to this region uh, through a transoral approach, far lateral approach, posterior lateral, and posterior. We are going to see every one of these and with some uh, examples, with some videos, with some uh, pictures about this region. Uh, the standard transoral approach, uh, after opening the mouth, the self-retaining retractor system is inserted in the mouth and the tongue retractor blade. It's used to maximally retract the tongue inferiorly, a vertical midline incision in the, para, in the pharyngeal wall is made over the C1 tubercle. Uh, this is this is a model that I ha, that I am reproducing. This is made in uh, plastic in resin. It's uh, made uh, with uh, molds of silicon, and then uh, I put uh, uh, the vertebral artery, the cranial nerves, and also the venous sinus. Uh, this is the anterior part of the craniocervical junction. So I think that this is one of the uh, most, uh, one of the easiest uh, surgical approach to the, to the craniocervical junction. But uh, uh, it's easy, but uh, we could have so many complications. Uh, for example, uh, the most common is uh, uh, to have a tear of the dura mater and to have a fistula fistula in this region. So uh, this is a work in cadaver. Uh, a, soft, a soft palate incision is made from the posterior margin of the palatal bone to the superior margin of the uvula. Next, the longus colimuscus and longus capitis are detached from their medial origin on the ventral surface of the cervical vertebra. 
a high speed reel is used to create a true 15 millimeters wide in the arch of C1 and then the odontoid is detached. I'm going to go to the, the, the anterior slide. So as you can see in, in this part, you, you can have at least uh, one centimeter uh, to the right and one centimeter to the left and to remove the, the anterior uh, part of, the, of C1. Uh, this is another model uh, that I am doing also. I am reproducing these models uh, in order to comprehend uh, much better this uh, difficult anatomy. So here we have the cervical spine with uh, occipital uh, C1, C2, C3, C4 through C7. So uh, uh, this is the anterior aspect. So once uh, we advance to, the, to, to making this approach, here you can see a, a cadaveric uh, dissection in which uh, I have uh, realized, I have uh, done the, the, the drilling of the, the clibus. Uh, what uh, we can see here is the lower cranial nerves, the vertebral arteries uh, joining to form the, the basilar artery. So here, uh, this is an injection. This is a drilling of uh, this part of the of the this region. So uh, we have uh, several uh, ligaments that uh, is very useful to understand this ligamentous architecture. This is uh, paramount in performing surgery in this region. Here we have the apical ligament, alar ligaments, cruciate ligament, the deep tectorial membrane, atlantoaxial joint, and the vertebral artery. These cruciate ligaments and the alar ligaments are very important to know in order to make a, 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 an approach in this site. This is a transoperatory view of uh, the drilling of the C1 to go to, to, to this approach. Uh, this is another picture in which uh, we are seeing the clibus soft palate. Arch of C1 has been removed and the posterior pharyngeal wall, longus coli, and anterior longitudinal ligament. This is a, a, a picture in a real patient uh, doing this kind of surgery. So here we have a, a, a skull base uh, to comprehend the, this uh, architecture, this bone region. And in the right side, we have the, the model that I am doing. Uh, in which you can see the medulla and uh, the vertebral arteries and this uh, venous sinus. So uh, the most important thing uh, I, 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 I am going to talk is uh, to preserve the nerves and also the arteries in this region. For example, here we have the vertebral artery, the right vertebral artery, the left vertebral artery, and this one is a, is a branch of these vertebral arteries. This is known as the, uh, the spinal anterior, the spinal anterior uh, artery. So here we have the pica in the right side. Uh, let's go to, to other view. This is an anterior view, anterior aspect of the medulla and both vertebral arteries. Uh, here we have the, the, the pica in the right side. And in the left side, uh, here we, am, we, we can see also the pica in the opposite side. But as you can see in here, this pica is not coming from vertebral artery. This is uncommon uh, variation, uh, 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 anatomical variation. Uh, Instead, uh, this uh, pica is coming from ICA. This is ICA in the left side, giving rise to this pica. On the other side, we have the right ICA. So here we have the lower, ne lower nerves. Uh, here we have the, the first uh, uh, spinal nerve. And in the anterior aspect of the medulla, this is the, the oligopontine sulci. In here, we can see the hypoglossal nerve. 
Uh, in this uh, other part, here we have a choroid plexus. So uh, this is the anterior uh, spinal artery. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, of course. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, in this picture, we can see the do both uh, vertebral arteries joining and form the basilar artery. Then this uh, tip of the uh, basilar artery is giving rise to the posterior cerebral artery in the left side and in the right side. So <clears throat> here we, have, we can see a, a communication between the anterior circulation with posterior circulation through the posterior communicating artery. This is the left posterior communicating artery. But uh, if, let's go to the opposite side. What we, are, we can see in the opposite side, there is no communication between this posterior uh, cerebral artery that is, commonly, that is coming directly from the, uh, uh, from the carotid, uh, supraclinal carotid artery. So here we don't have a communication. So we, we, in, in this specimen, uh, we cannot see the, uh, 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 a Willis circle, a circle of Willis, uh, as we know. So uh, uh, which other structures we can see in here? The third nerve uh, 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 that uh, passes uh, between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebral artery. Uh, this is a this is a video uh, to to explain you this uh, this uh, this uh, complex uh, anatomy. So uh, this is a choroid plexus. Uh, here we have the ICA in the left side and pica coming from this ICA, this uh, left ICA. So. Uh, uh, here we have uh, some uh, uh, arteries uh, that are going to, to the medulla, lateral aspect of the medulla. Look at this. Uh, here uh, we have the anterior spinal artery coming from uh, this uh, vertebral artery. There is no pica coming from vertebral. Instead, it's coming from the ICA. Victor, can I yes. a comment? Could you explain to the students how you, uh, how you do that with the latex, how you inject it and stuff? How long it takes, etc. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a latex uh, in color red, and I inject also latex in color blue to the veins. So uh, I make uh, the preparation of the latex, and then I, I put uh, some color red, uh, and then uh, catalyzer. I inject the arteries in the carotid artery, in the common carotid artery in the neck of the cadaver. So uh, this is a, 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 a fresh specimen. So we can make this uh, uh, in Mexico City, in the Institute of uh, Forensic Sciences, uh, in uh, unidentified persons. So uh, we have a, a special uh, permission to make this kind of uh, dissection, this kind of investigation. So uh, the reason uh, that, uh, we ca that, we, that we could have uh, this uh, injection is uh, a fresh brain. So if you do this in a old brain in a fixed brain is more difficult to have these, uh, these images. Okay. So, uh, for example, in here, uh, look at this video. 
this is anterior aspect of the brain stem and the, the encephalo. And this is the supraclinod, the left supraclinod carotid artery. Uh, this is the posterior communicating artery, P1 of the posterior cerebral artery, P2. P1, P2, and posterior communicating artery. This supraclinal carotid artery is also giving rise to the anterior choroidal artery, is this one. This supraclinal carotid artery bifurcates in two arteries, A1, A1, the left A1, and middle cerebral artery. This is the, the bifurcation. This is A1, and this is small branches. This is the anterior communicating artery, this one. The anterior cerebral artery in the right side, this one. A2 left, A2 right. This is a hypoplastic A1 in the left side. Supraclinal carotid artery in the left side, the right side, sorry, right side. Middle cerebral artery. And posterior communicating artery. But in this case, we don't have a real communication between this posterior. So posterior cerebral artery is coming directly from this, this artery. So this is known also as a fetal variant of the posterior communicating artery, giving rise to the posterior cerebral artery. Bifurcation of uh, basilar artery. Small branches coming from posterior cerebral artery. This is hypothalamus. Optic stria, this one. Optic nerves, a chiasma. In fundibular stalk, uh, this is another picture. In the small picture, uh, this is a uh, uh, anterior aspect of the medulla in the brain stem. So, in this in this, uh, in this brain, uh, the Artery is not injected, only the, the venous of uh, the brain. And then I injected uh, the vertebral arteries uh, in, this, in this way. I put uh, a small catheter uh, to inject uh, this, uh, this latex, and I could have this uh, injection. It's very nice, uh, this injection, because we can see uh, the, the anterior irrigation of this uh, medulla, in the anterior aspect of the medulla. So uh, if uh, you have a lesion, a tumor, for example, on meningioma in this region, you, you should uh, avoid uh, uh, the, the, these uh, nerves in order to preserve the important function of the lower cranial nerves for example, the hypoglossal nerve that is coming in the anterior sulci of uh, oligopontine sulci. 
and the, in the posterior sulci uh, we we have the ten uh, the nine ten and eleven and eleven uh, lower cranial nerves so uh, it's very very important to know this specific uh, gross anatomy of this uh, region so <clears throat> this is another picture uh, we can see a hypoplastic vertebral artery in this side in the other side this artery is uh, practically is giving rise to the basilar artery. So we have also uh, the hypoglossal, the 9, 10, and 11 cranial nerves. And then the uh, first, the one, the second, the third, uh, cervical, anterior cervical cranial nerves. And uh, also uh, the, the, this uh, venous system. The anterior spinal artery is uh, very important because uh, this artery is, uh, is uh, giving, is, this is coming from uh, the vertebral arteries and irrigates uh, all the anterior aspect of the medulla. This is a, a cut, an axial cut in the midbrain. So here we can see the, the posterior cerebral arteries, P1, P2, P2A, P2B, and P3. The posterior aspect of the uh, medulla, the obix, uh, the inferior uh, part of the ventricle, the fourth ven the ventricle, and the cerebellum. So these are another... Uh, 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 pictures uh, in which uh, we can see these uh, vertebral arteries and the pica in this side in the other side. And this is a bifurcation of the basilar tip of the, 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 the basilar artery. So uh, this is a, a dissection in the, uh, in the anterior aspect of the craniovertebral junction. Uh, this is, uh, this is the, the uh, anterior part of C1. So once I remove uh, this anterior part, uh, part of, the, of C1, you can see the dense uh, uh, the odontoid process. This is, this is here. So I, I cut uh, the ligaments and you can see here the, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, bone. Uh, this is, these are the alar ligaments and the odontoid process. Uh, this is really, really hard. It's a very sclerosed uh, bone uh, and is covered uh, with this uh, ligament, cruciate ligament. Uh, this is the cruciate ligament. I separate this to see the ligaments of the bones, the other ligaments. So the odontoid hypophysis is a very sclerosed and resistant bone, which even with a chisel, Chisel, it costs to cut. This is really beautiful to, to see this uh, uh, odontoid hypothesis. Again, this uh, odontoid hypothesis covered with the, lig with the cruciate ligament. Uh, you know that if you have uh, an on a stable uh, 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 articulation uh, and on a stable uh, craniocervical junction, you have to, to put uh, some screws in the first uh, vertebras, in the, mass, uh, in the lateral mass of the, these uh, uh, vertebras. Uh, this is only, this was uh, in the patient and this is a cadaveric uh, exercise in which we can put these uh, screws in the lateral mass uh, in these uh, uh, cervical vertebras. Here we have the, the, the upper part of the cervical spinal cord, uh, and these, uh, these are the cranial nerves. So uh, let's go uh, to, 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 this, uh, to this view, this uh, slide. Uh, I open the dura mater and you can see the, the, 
the screws and uh, if you put a screw in this um, lateral mass uh, you you need to respect the nerves these nerves and also the vertebral arteries and also the uh, not to introduce this screw to the uh, spinal canal so this is another beautiful picture in which uh, I open the dura mater and to see the, this cranial nerve and the dentate ligament. This, this is the dentate ligaments, this one. This is uh, uh, a picture, in, in, in a draw in this uh, region. Uh, look at this, it's very, very important to know this anatomical uh, region in order to in order to avoid uh, lesion these these uh, important nerves so uh, these models are uh, made to knew much better the anatomy of this uh, uh, challenging region and to avoid damage the, the cranial nerves um, here we have a, a posterior aspect of the cerebellum uh, the medulla and the upper uh, cervical spinal cord the, the first uh, cranial nerves, the, these root nerves of the cervical, cervical nerves. And here we have the, the vertebral artery giving rise to a posterior, a superior posterior spinal artery, posterior spinal artery. These uh, posterior spinal arteries are coming from these vertebral arteries. Uh, for example, in, in a posterior uh, uh, approach to this, uh, to this craniovertebral junction, uh, in this case, uh, I have a syringobulbia. Uh, you can see the syrinx in the uh, superior uh, spinal cord is very wide. Uh, the patient was in very bad condition, motor conditions. So I did an approach in the posterior aspect. Uh, uh, for this reason, it's uh, important to know uh, these uh, anatomical uh, uh, structures. And here we, uh, I, here we have the, uh, the uh, anterior, the preoperatory uh, syringobulbia, syringobulbia, and then uh, look at this. Uh, the, the, the result was uh, impressive because uh, is, is syringobulbia uh, uh, disappear almost completely, almost. Uh, here we have a uh, remnant of the uh, cervical syringo, syringomyelia. Uh, here we have some, some uh, aspects uh, to know in this kind of approach. This is the upper part of the cervical spinal cord. Look at this, this is uh, really beautiful to see the, liga the dentate ligaments and the first uh, cranial nerves. Dentate ligaments. <clears throat> In the posterior lateral approach, I think it's, uh, it's uh, easy to make a, a, a surgery in this region. So uh, the only thing is that you, you should know the, for example, here we have the vertebral artery and the second cranial nerve, this one. So it's uh, very important to recognize this vertebral artery and uh, these cranial nerves uh, in order to avoid uh, damage them. So this is a close uh, view. And here we have the, the vertebral artery and giving rise to a posterior uh, spinal artery. So it's very important to respect this, this artery. This is a, a, a surgical a surgical case. Uh, well, this is uh, this is not a surgical. This is a dissection. Uh, look here the lower cranial nerves. Uh, 
And this is a, a preoperative image. In um, this is a, a mini geoma in the posterior lateral aspect of uh, in this patient. Uh, so you should remember the this uh, the anatomy of the vertebral artery. Uh, this is the uh, surgical steps uh, to do this uh, this surgery. So uh, the the results uh, was uh, was very good. The total removing of this tumor. This is the preoperative and postoperative uh, pictures. Uh, we have some pictures in the trans uh, transoperative resection of this meningioma. Uh, this is a, a, a coronal view uh, in the preoperative uh, uh, preoperative uh, uh, stage, and this is the postoperative stage. Practically, uh, the, the, the tumor was uh, totally removed. Uh, after the resection of this uh, tumor, we, here we have the, the incision that was made in, in this uh, female patient. Uh, this is an axial view. In this, you can see how the medulla was uh, almost collapsed in this, uh, in this uh, view. So the, the tumor uh, uh, was uh, big in this uh, place. After the, the, res the, the, the resection, uh, here we have the, the medulla and the superior aspect of the spinal cord. The far lateral approach. I think the far lateral approach is uh, the most difficult uh, uh, approach in this uh, region. Here we have a, a giant meningioma in this, in this, in this female patient. Look at uh, the size of this. Uh, the medulla was almost collapsed. Uh, and I did uh, an approach in this region. Uh, you should know very well the insertion of these muscles, the transverse process of this uh, craniovertebral junction, because if you detach the, the superior oblique muscle uh, is in this part. If you, if you detach the superior oblique muscle and also the inferior oblique muscle, uh, you are going to, to, to see the lateral, the, the lateral process of, uh, the, of C1. So if you remove the, this lateral aspect, you, you are going to the vertebral artery and you can mobilize this uh, vertebral artery in order to advance to the to the condyle occipital condyle and the lateral mass of the of C1. So this is a a, a, um, a bone, uh, an occipital or craniocervical junction. Uh, this is made in resin. Uh, I am doing this kind of models to recognize the. Structure. Superior oblique muscle, superior uh, rectus muscle, as you can see, his superior obliquus, rectus capitis. So superior obliquus and inferior obliquus. Uh, this is the superior obliquus, inferior obliquus, and the rectus capitis major, rector capitis minor. Uh, in here we have the this uh, cranial, first cranial nerve and the vertebral artery. So it's very, very important to know this, this, this part of, the, of this uh, region. So this is a, a, a real bone. This is a, a real skull. Uh, this is uh, some of the, the, the anatomical aspects of this uh, skull base uh, that is very useful to know. This is a cadaveric dissection. Uh, once you advance in this uh, dissection, it's very difficult to recognize uh, the muscles, uh, difficult to recognize the vertebral artery. So that's the reason uh, before you make approach like this, uh, at least you should make, uh, you should make at least uh, 10 dissections in a cadaveric specimen. Uh, if not, you are going to have problems. You are going to have intraoperative uh, uh, risk uh, when you uh, are going to work with the vertebral artery.
So this is a preoperative uh, view of this tumor. This is postoperative. I couldn't remove all this tumor, but I almost removed 90% of this tumor. What's the reason I didn't remove this this uh, uh, tumor because it was very attached to the lower cranial nerves. Uh, so it's very important not to remove all the tumor if you are not sure that uh, you are avoiding lesion is lower cranial nerves. So this is another uh, axial view uh, in which we can see the the medulla the vertebral artery and uh, this uh, posterior spinal artery. This is the arc of the atlas, atlas arc. A close view, closer view in this to see the posterior spinal artery. So in here, uh, what, uh, what I can tell you is, uh, you just remember, that surgical anatomy is not only an art, uh, but also a patient to give an understanding over the disease to avoid the suffering of the humanity. So I, I want to show you the, the uh, I have finished this, uh, this uh, talk about clinical uh, junction, but I want to show you the models I am doing. This is, this is the, the model and this is uh, the, the muscles. Okay. Let's go to... Um, So uh, I, I, I I want you to um, okay. So can you see me? Yes. 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 Okay. So, uh, this is this is the model I am doing. So here we have the occip the occipital bone, and here we have C uh, one. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, I have in here C1, C2, C3. This seems to be a real bone, but it is not. It is, uh, it is made in resin. But this is made in, uh, in a scale one per one. So this model has no more, no less than a real one. So here we have also the, the vertebral artery. This is made of a latex. Uh, and, and I am also uh, doing the muscles. Uh, for example, here we have the, the oblique, superior oblique muscles that insert in the inferior cresta of the of the of the of the occipital, and then uh, go goes uh, to to the transfer process of C1. And here we have the, the another one that is the major uh, rectus in this, this side. So uh, this is really good. This is a, a, a very, very nice model to understand this uh, craniocervical, this craniocervical junction. So you have uh, some question? Okay. Do you have some questions? Great, Victor. Uh, awesome uh, illustrations. Uh, and uh, I'd like to open it up. Mar any comments, uh, Marco, or any of the neurosurgeons that are in attendance? Okay, I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Kabulo from the Congo. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Victor. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I think. They, they, you showed one slide where there was a hypoplastic uh, vertebral artery on the left, on the right side, and the left side was normal. So my question was, uh, yes. on which basis are yes. you talking about the hypoplastic uh, vertebral artery? Because we know that there is one which is dominant, 
and mostly it's the left which is dominant. So do you measure, like to say, it's dominant on the right side, it has to be like this, and the normal one has to be like this. Or you know, on, like, how do you qualify it like hypoplastic? And uh, when do you talk about dominant and non-dominant? Oh, okay. So, um, uh, how do I qualify if one is uh, hypoplastic or not? Uh, I think uh, in this uh, artery there is no uh, an specific uh, uh, qualification of uh, this measure. But as you know, for example, uh, Dr. Rotton, uh, Dr. Rotton uh, used to describe the hypoplastic artery uh, when this artery uh, measures less than one millimeter. For example, the, the posterior communicating artery, specifically the posterior communicating arteries. When they are, when they, when, when they measure uh, less than one millimeter are uh, hypoplastic. But in the case of the vertebral artery, uh, when I see uh, both arteries, uh, is uh, uh, the, the view of uh, this allows me to, to see which is dominant and which is not dominant. Another thing is uh, in this kind of uh, patients, it's much better to make a preoperative angiography in order to know uh, how, we, how are the vertebral arteries. Uh, thank you so much. Maybe my second question. Uh, when you are doing your transoral approach, apart from uh, bony uh, abnormality like a fracture uh, of odontoid peg and whatever, what else can you do via that approach, especially in the posterior fossa? Uh, um, like the meningioma you were showing, did you do it via transoral approach or you did posterior approach? No, posterior approach, of course. Uh, we have the, the, the far lateral approach. Uh, you know, when a tumor is uh, also in the anterior aspect of uh, this cranial vertebral junction, you can use uh, 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 the far lateral approach. Thank you. Okay, very good. Any more comments or questions? Marco, go ahead, there's a student from Cameroon. Thank you very much, Mr. Victor Hugo Perez, for the presentation. I think it was really incredible, especially for aspiring neurosurgeons like us to really master the anatomy of such a challenging region. I particularly appreciate the models that you used to see. So I wanted to know from your experience, do you think that in our context it is feasible that we produce such uh, models to help us understand anatomy in case we cannot really practice on cadavers. Did you get that, Victor? Yes. Uh, question was uh, if I can introduce these models okay. in order to comprehend the, the craniovertebral junction anatomy, of course. The reason, the main reason to, to do this is, is that. So, I, I hope uh, uh, Dr. John Bennett uh, could uh, give you my email and we can see how I, I, how I can send you some models of this, okay. uh, at least three or four as a gift uh, to you. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, 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 it's only a, um, a model to, to comprehend much better this uh, surgical anatomy. Okay, Victor, can do. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Dr. Victor, thank you again. Uh, so I'm now going like to the west part. Uh, in case of uh, approach to the cranial vertebral junction, then uh, in case you damage the vertebral artery, uh, what do you do? How do you repair it? Well, uh, I have not had a, a, a lesion in this artery, but it depends if you have a, 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 an important uh, a, a lesion, you should, uh, uh, you should close uh, the vertebral artery. You, you should put uh, some... Uh, uh, you should uh, uh, 
uh, close the circulation. So, uh, uh, if the other vertebral artery is, is um, a big artery and not hypoplastic, uh, I think that uh, uh, is not going to have a problem. So I think uh, it's possible to close the vertebral artery in an, in a in a lesion. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you so much. Then, um, what do you do? Do you isolate it like uh, what they do in uh, aneurysm, uh, ruptured aneurysm, when you are like clipping? You isolate from the neck, and in case of uh, damage to the artery. You put a temporary clip, then you repair, or what do you do? Well, I, I don't do vascular, uh, vascular uh, uh, surgery. Okay. So I don't have uh, an answer for you. It's okay. okay I saw Dr. John Minarki, Minarki, raising the hand, maybe you wanted to answer. What was the question? I think you broke up, no, Dr. Cabello. Can you repeat it? Yes, I can hear you. I was saying I saw Dr. Minarchik uh, raising his hand. I thought maybe he wanted to, to give a comment. No, well, actually, I'd like to introduce, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, a world-renowned pathologist that's on our panel, a gentleman that's done a lot more of this than we have. He's done it for years, online med medical education. And John, welcome. <laughs> That's very, very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear fine. Yes, yes. Seeing that you're running the show here. And I was very, very, very fascinated by Dr. Perez's presentation. And I'm here astounded uh, about it. Thank you very much, Dr. Perez. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, John. It's a pleasure to, to see you. Well, you know, Victor, I want to take you through John's uh, website, uh, what he's been doing for, for years. How, how long have you been doing this, John? Uh, I, love, I got too old or I've been doing it too long, but it's about 10 years. 10 years. Okay. I'm just going to go through your website. Can everyone see this okay? Yes. Okay. I can see it. Okay. Yes, we can do it here. Well, oh. that's what I looked like about what am I 10 doing years. There? Okay. You can see that okay? Yes, yes. Well, I just wanted to say, no matter what you're seeing, uh, my website basically is just a storage facility for all of the movies that I've made for 10 years. I started out making some very basic medical student level histology movies, and then I made about 500 uh, histopathology movies where I take tissues and explain what the abnormalities are. And now for about the last seven or eight years, I've been having my yearly course uh, stored there as well. So I, I just got back from Puerto Rico last week and I, I teach an entire medical school pathology course there, you know, a medical school level. And I, uh, while I, I am in the uh, classroom, talking to the students, I'm also broadcasting. So like the one thing I would like to urge all of you who are very much into online teaching is that if you are at medical school to make some kind of presentation, they should honor you by allowing you to broadcast your presentation online to the whole world while you are speaking within their uh, room full of students. And that's what I've been doing. And if you just go to that website, I'm not advertising it. Uh, I made it myself. So it's a very basic website. So, you know, it's, there's nothing fancy about it. But the uh, two terabytes of medical educational videos that I have made over the last, oh, 10 years or so, maybe more, are, are linked onto that. So if you want to see technology, if you want to see 500 different histopathology slides. And I even saved my last three or four years worth of, uh, oh, about 60 or 70 uh, two-hour webinars of basic pathology for medical students. I'm very proud of it. And uh, I'm 71 years old now. Even though I've gotten older, 
I think the webinars in general have gotten better because every year I try to uh, fix them up a little bit and make them better. And that's all that I have to say, John, and thank you very much for Well, John, are you still dancing during your, your presentations, correct? Yes. <laughs> well, that, well, well, John, okay, it's medicalschoolpathology.com. And the reason I, why I wanted you to meet the Cameroon students Yes, I, uh, they, they I would can love benefit. to meet the Cameroon students. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you've had them from all over the world. Because um, until now, there's only one thing I know about Cameroon. I'm sorry, I don't know very much. But I know that Shakira, who did her song for the World Cup when she was talking about Waka Waka, <laughs> it was a Cameroon song originally, and that's the only thing I know about Cameroon. Okay, you know more than me. <laughs> also happened to be the most widely watched video in the history of YouTube. That's how I found out about it. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a non-neurosurgical tidbit, but we'll take it. <laughs> okay, very good. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, we're gonna thanks John for coming by, and Victor, thanks for another great presentation. And we'll be continuing probably with more of Victor's. Uh, presentations and thanks Marco for coming and and thanks uh, everyone at Victor great and thanks everyone so uh, we'll end this broadcast and uh, we'll see you next week ciao thank you bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. okay I'm gonna stop here